It's good to see you guys today. Y'all glad to be seen today? I'm glad that you are. I hope you have your Bibles with you today. And uh, either that by way of technology or by way of print media. I, I prefer the print media myself, but I understand we're in, in a new generation. You'll find with me Matthew chapter 5. I hope you also picked up a copy of your sermon notes today because I want to actually begin with the back side of the sermon notes today. Weeks ago, we heavily actually shared with us regarding the wellsprings, and uh, it's an old Puritan sort of concept that came back in the early revivals of our day, and um, they have been working as a prayer team to put together a document of sorts to be able to help to navigate themselves on Wednesday nights. We meet together every Wednesday night for prayer at 5 p.m. Love for you guys to join us. We're here for about an hour. We just gather in the sanctuary. It's a small group of people, but we would love for you to join us if you ever feel inclined to do so. Um, beyond that, we, we've been working toward trying to find a way. There's been a prayer guide on the back of your bulletin now for quite a while, uh, two or three years, I suppose. Diane Hill I helped us for some time back uh, to be able to sort of navigate a sort of a monthly prayer focus, and she tried to work off of sermon text and that kind of stuff because I would give her stuff ahead of time that she would sort of work on. But we've sort of tried to shift gears a bit, and we wanted to take this Wellsprings idea and begin to invite our congregation to begin joining us and sharing with us in this journey Part of the wellsprings, step number one, is basically out of the 12 wells, there's actually the first well is actually things that only God can do. You know, we, we talk about that tongue in cheek. When we get into trouble, we oftentimes say, Lord, we need you, we need you to help me get out of this mess, right? You know, the, he's, he's, he's the only one that can fix this thing that we've dug for ourselves, this well that we've dug for ourselves. But sometimes I think we sort of look at life this way. God, I know you're busy. I'll get this thing worked out myself, and if I get in trouble, I'll call you. But there are things in life that only God can do. We can't save ourselves. Only God can save us. And the list goes on and on and on of things that he, only he can do. One of them that we have listed for you today is found for us in John 16. We don't convict each other of sin, right? That's not our role. Sometimes we judge each other, right? Sometimes that happens. But the reality, conviction has to come from somebody a lot different than us. It has to come from somebody that knows the thoughts and intents of our hearts and knows the words we speak and that kind of stuff. But Romans chapter 16 tells us that the helper or the comforter that God's going to send to us, part of the role that he's going to do in our life is to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. And the passage goes on, but ultimately it ends this way, he will guide you into all truth. That's his role. That's the Spirit's role. And as this whole concept is developing, there's a, there's a prayer that we ask you to look at and, and pray through. Pr pr bring, it's talking about pr repentance and true repentance and some scriptures, uh, Psalm two, uh, Philippians 2, Psalm 139, Isaiah 30. And then it comes to this last statement for reflection that has to do with this bread of adversity and water of affliction. Y'all, Anybody ever had any trouble Anybody ever got in trouble? I'm not talking about the guy behind you with the blue light. That's not the trouble. Now, I, sometimes it happens that way. But uh, sometimes our trouble really is, is brought about simply because of something we've done. We've done something stupid. Y'all ever done that? <laughs> Lying is still a sin. You know, I just want you to know that. Sometimes we do something really stupid and we get sort of uh, we, 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 we get caught or whatever it is and we're in trouble because of it. And God sometimes allows the adversity that comes because of our own stupidity. But there's also, oftentimes, sometimes God allows adversity to come our way that we didn't have any involvement in bringing. 
but was there a purpose of that? And part of the Wellsprings concept is that there is purpose in that because as we've said of our children sometimes and our grandchildren, those of us who have some age on us, is that sometimes our children or grandchildren don't ever quite come back or come to the Lord until they've got to the end of the rope. And we sort of say, you know, God had to ring their bell in order to get their attention. But God does that not just for our children and grandchildren. Sometimes he does it for all of us. And so part of our prayer focus for this month of July is I would invite you to look at this. Pray with us the month. What I've got a hunch you're going to say, we read through it today and, well, Pastor, I've done that for the month of July. (laughs) I've done it. No, no, no. Do it every day. Meditate through it. I've got a hunch if you'll take and do that seriously, Psalm 139 is going to take a real new perspective in your life because when you ask the Lord to search you and know you, try you, see if there's any wicked way within you, it's amazing. God may show you something today and he may show you something totally different tomorrow because it's his timing. And so I would invite you to join with us for the month of July, praying through this. That as a congregation, we might find a way to bring ourselves to a place where we might be more submissive and obedient to his precious name. That sort of brings us to the reason why we're in this series anyway in Beatitudes. I'm oftentimes asked, well, Pastor, how do you, do, y'all, do you just look online somewhere and get a, pass, get a sermon somewhere? And the answer to that is no, it's not. Uh, But the reality is sometimes that's birthed with all kinds of sort of ideas and God stews over this. This sermon series has been sort of stewing in my heart since the early February. If you remember back, we did a series in February called Relationships That Rock and Pastor Don Maiden was the first of those that actually spoke on that. And his relationships that rock, he said, if it's going to rock, if it's going to be a relationship that rocks, you've got to build it on the rock. In Matthew chapter 7, and it was his reading of that and sort of began to stir my heart a bit that I have been reading through the Sermon on the Mount almost consistently through that, and God has been working and just developing and just just molding my life and shaping me. It's been a neat process. It's not always been fun, but the Word of God's not always fun, but it's been transformative, and that's what God's Word needs to be done doing in our life. And so as we sort of begin this series, and we are actually going to finish the Sermon on the Mount in 2025, so we've sort of planned out futuristically, but we're just going to take the bite of the Beatitudes for now, and then we're going to transition out to another area, and then we'll come back to the Sermon on the Mount. But I want to take an opportunity today to be able to sort of give some insight in that, because as Pastor Don said in Matthew chapter 7, if the person who takes and hears the Word of God and puts it into practice He is equated or like a man who builds his house upon a what? Rock. And a man who hears the word of God and does not apply what he says is like a man who builds his house upon the sand. The storms of life are going to come to both of them, right? They happen. It it just happens. But one of those houses is going to stand firm and the other one's not. And the only difference between the two is the one whether or not we choose to build our house on the principles and the teaching of the Word of God. And so I look back and I think through and I I chew on this fact because I, I look at our culture today and I'm wondering, do we even know what it means to be a follower of Christ anymore? Do we? Is it just a church thing we do? Is it just a giving once in a while that we do? Is it opening our Bibles or reading a devotion, a nice little devotion once in a while? Is that what makes us a follower of Christ? Is that what defines for us? Is that what it looks like or feels like to be a follower of Christ, just to do those things? I think we've got in our culture so attuned to we look on the outward things of life and we assume if a, per, assume if a person dresses a certain way or, or acts a certain way or smells a certain way or whatever it may be, we sort of pinhole that person to be a follower of Christ or not. 
But I'm convinced, more so now than I ever have been, that a follower of Christ is not something that you put on. It's something that transforms from the inside out. And I really think the Beatitudes was intended for that purpose. As Jesus gathered his group of followers, Matthew, Mark chapter, Matthew chapter 4, there was a whole group of people. Remember the crowds? At the end of chapter 4, they were following him. There's miracles happening, demons being cast out. There's a lot of stuff happening, a lot of busy time. And Jesus then takes his disciples and steps up on a mountain. He gets away from the crowds, although the crowds follow him. He gets away from the busyness of activity in order to talk about the things that are more serious than the current felt needs. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. And he begins with this passage, I believe, that helps you and I to understand something about the inner person that God is seeking to develop as he's called us to be followers of Jesus Christ. It starts on the inside of every one of us. And so I believe the Beatitudes helps us to be able to see that and understand that a bit. So with your Bibles open this morning, Matthew chapter 5, I want to pick back up and I'm going to read the text that we have before us today, verses 1 through 12. Jesus, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain and when he had sat down with his disciples, they came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, and here's what we've said previously. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for, they, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will shall inherit the earth. That's the passage we're going to be looking at today. Blessed are the meek. Verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. As I understand this passage... I believe Jesus is helping us to understand what it really means to be a follower of Christ. I believe he's saying that a follower of Christ is someone who has genuinely found themselves poor in spirit, who understands mourning, who is meek, who hungers and thirsts after righteousness, who is merciful, who is pure in heart, who is a peacemaker, and who is persecuted for righteousness. It has little to do with anything on the external, although the internal must transform itself out into the external. But you're not a Christian. You're not a follower of Christ because of what you do on the outside. You're a follower of Christ because of what started on the inside. As Debbie this morning entered the waters of baptism, she simply said to you and to I, to, as, to the church, I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ. I've chosen to follow him in salvation, but today I publicly declare to you that I am a follower of Jesus Christ. That's all baptism does. But we look so oftentimes on the externals to be the proof or the, or the things that matter. And, and the truth of the matter is, it's not to excuse the external, but it all has to begin in the, in the inside. And today we're going to be talking about this word meek. I think it would be helpful for us to understand today what meek means. How would we define it? And sometimes we have to sort of look at what it doesn't mean in order for us to understand what it does mean. So when I think about the word meek, what I do know is this meek in our culture today does not have generally a positive connotation. If you're going to tell somebody today you're a meek person, you're probably not giving them a compliment. Correct? Correct? As a matter of fact, if you were to look at the word meek and look underneath some of the um, synonyms of the word meek, here's some of the words you would find. Humble, docile, mild, calm, gentle, peaceful, tame, submissive, soft, spineless, passive, and broken. There's another list of synonyms that I found as well who have sort, sort of short phrases that describe what it means to be meek. 
Here are some of them. To eat dirt, to lick the dust, to cringe like a dog, to take it on the chin. You know, when I think about these synonyms and I were to, be, were to sort of replace some of that, that, those synonyms into what Jesus had to say, blessed are the meek, let's just change one to this. Blessed are the spineless, for they will inherit the kingdom of that, that, that just doesn't do a lot for you, does it? <laughs> because we oftentimes equate meekness with weakness and nothing can further be from the truth. You know, when we talk about somebody being meek, we talk about a man being meek, weak, meek we sometimes sort of think about he's sort of like Casper Milk Toast, you know, without any backbone. Or maybe a lady who's meek is a lady who lets her husband walk all over her. But when I look at this concept of meekness defined for us in Scripture, this is not what I see at all. As a matter of fact, let's go with we can to point number two in your notes. Meekness is defined for us in three words. Oh, we've heard this many times, power under control. I'm going to give you a little bit of a, another definition toward that is tender steel. Something that's, something that's strong as steel and yet as pliable as putty. You know, when I look at Scripture, there were only two people ever defined as meek in Scripture. Only two. One of them, one, one of them was Jesus. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28, 29, and 30 tells us, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you... Remember what it says? I'll give you what? Rest. Take, upon, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. Jesus defined himself as being meek. And he gives to us an opportunity to understand that. We'll come to the second person in Scripture that was defined as meek in just a few moments. But if we want to talk about meekness, we would use words, I think, that, would, that, the, that the original writers would use. When the ancient Greeks would talk about uh, meekness, they would say it this way. A meek man was neither timid nor was he given to fits of anger. Aristotle actually defined Meekness as the absence of excessive anger, anger, yet getting angry at the right time for the right reason and in the right way is okay. The Greeks would also use the word meekness to define things like words that are mild, medicine that is soothing, wind that is refreshing, and a horse that has been tamed. What do all those have in common? It's forms of power that have been harnessed for good rather than for evil. If we were to go back in Scripture, we would find one of the longest passages of Scripture, and hopefully we'll get there in time. We may may run out of time before I get there today, but at least it's in your notes referencing later on. Psalm 37 is a great passage of Scripture that basically speaks to us us regarding this issue of meekness. And, in, and the writer of Psalm, Psalm, it's the, in Psalm 37 would tell us that the meek man basically is the man who has learned to be submissive to the will of God. He has yielded his right and his rights to God. He is living underneath the authority of God himself. He is literally power under the control of the Almighty. The Greeks talked about meekness regarding a man who faced insults and yet remained silent in the insults. Matter of fact, we would look in Scripture and we would find Scripture sort of complimenting meekness in many places. I've given these references to you in your notes. hope you'll go back there and study them maybe a little later on. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 tells us that, uh, that meekness is literally a fruit or a byproduct of the Spirit-controlled life. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness. That's the word meekness there. That that becomes a part, a byproduct of what God is doing in our life, what the Spirit is doing in our life as we learn to submit ourselves underneath His authority. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 tells us that meekness is part of the clothing that we're to put on as a follower of Christ. It ought to be something that encompasses our being. James chapter 1 verses 19 through 21 tells us that meekness is the opposite of moral and, and moral filth and anger and has challenged his followers, the church in Jerusalem, to be able to put on meekness rather than these things of anger and moral filth. 
It's the basic attitude in in Titus chapter 3, verse 2, that we should have to all people. And Paul would say to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, he said it was also especially to be used upon those who oppose us. And then maybe the most powerful verse in Scripture that we have regarding meekness is found for us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, that tells us about the gentle and quiet spirit, the meek spirit of a wife, a committed follower of Jesus Christ who, who's married to a man who does not know Jesus Christ as his Savior is probably the greatest and the most powerful tool in the arsenal of her life to be able to win her husband to Jesus. Meekness. Let's take an opportunity sometimes to be able to see meekness as it's lived out. And so let's talk, if we can, regarding the meekness illustrated. Number two in your notes, meekness illustrated. I said there was only two people in the Bible that was ever mentioned as meek, and Jesus being one of them. Who's the other one? Does anybody know? Moses. Numbers chapter 12, I'd love for you to turn there with me because I'd love for us to look at that passage because I believe it helps us to be able to see how, mo- how, how, how meekness is often lived out and it should be lived out in life. Numbers chapter 12 is a great, great passage of Scripture. As a matter of fact, Moses is in, 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 in the process of leading the children of Israel toward the promised land. They never quite get there because of some sidesteps along the journey of faith, but he's in the process of it all. And while he's there uh, on this journey... He finds himself underneath the criticism of the people that were close to him. His brother, Aaron, and his brother's wife, Miriam. Numbers chapter 12 gives to us that. Matter of fact, your, matter of fact, your heading may say something along those lines and over top of that. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. In other words, they were, they were criticizing Moses because of his wife. Now, we need to understand that in this culture that he had married an African lady. That's, that's where the Cushites were actually at. Well, it's probably maybe one of the first references we have in Scripture of an interracial relationship. And Aaron and his wife, Miriam, are criticizing Moses for doing such a thing as if they are having some sense of authority over him regarding the, 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 this choice of a wife. And the reality is, as they begin to criticize him regarding that, well, let's just listen to the story, if we can, for just a moment. Verse 2, and they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? In other words, God does, does God not speak through us as well? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord, I love this, and yet it's scary as well, and the Lord heard them. Do you realize that there's not anything you'll ever say in your life that the Lord doesn't hear? Just pause. And if we would just take a moment to pause before we speak to realize that thought, we might speak less words. Just a thought. Just how's that working for you, huh? Needless to say, the Lord heard it. Now, the man Moses was very meek, and we give this. Matter of fact, some, trans, some translations actually have verse 3 in parentheses as sort of a description, and that's what it's, the purpose of it is. The man Moses was very meek, more than all the people who were on the face of the earth, and suddenly the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and Miriam, come out, you three, out of the tent of meeting. They were inside of a tent. They were away from the crowds. They were sort of all along Aaron and Miriam were criticizing Moses for the choice he had made in his wife. And God spoke to them and invited them out of the tent. The next verse says, and they all came out. And and they all came out. uh, And and the three of them came out. Verse 5, and the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forward. And he said, hear my words, as there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him. In a vision, I speak with him. In a dream, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him, I speak mouth to mouth clearly and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Have you no fear of God? 
Now, let me, let me put a caveat in here because if we're not careful, we're going we're gonna to try to apply Scripture in ways that it should never be applied. I, I grew up in, a, in, a, in an area of the country that took the passage in Corinthians that, that uh, we should not be unequally yoked to unbelievers. You know that passage? And we oftentimes apply that to marriage, and it, it, I, think that, I think that's a correct application. But we oftentimes, at least where I grew up, oftentimes talked about marriage in, among, among, across racial boundaries, across ethnic boundaries, is taboo before God. And we use that passage to be able to, to define it being taboo. And the reality is that's, what the, that's not what that passage had to say at all. The reality was Moses had married a Cushite woman. I'm not sure the reason of all that. I, they fell in love, I suppose. I, I don't really know. But who was Aaron and Miriam to criticize Moses for the choice he had made in a wife? If anybody had anything to say about it, it should be God. And if God's not saying anything about it, who are we to speak, right? Can we just agree on that? And so at the end of the day, Miriam and Aaron thought it would be wise to criticize our leader because of the choices he made. And God called the three of them out, came down in a pillar of cloud, a pillar of cloud among them, covered them over, called Miriam and Aaron forward. They stood and Moses stands back. And by the way, let me just ask you a question. Read that passage. Read it time and time. What is the first words Moses said? You know, I, I, you know, if it were me, if I, if I were Moses, I'm glad I'm not. I wouldn't want to do the children of Israel. I promise you that would have been, not been a good thing. We didn't have cars back in the, How did we even, how did we navigate? Anyway, but uh, needless to say, I would have been saying, who are you to talk, me, talk about me this way? I mean, we, I'd had something to say. What does, Mary, what does Moses say? Absolutely nothing. He remains silent. Now look at the story, how it continues on. Verse 6, and he said, hear my words. If there's a prophet, you read that story. I spoke with him as face to face. And the anger of the Lord kindled, verse 9, against them. And the Lord departed. In other words, the cloud lifted. When the cloud removed from over the tent, behold, look. That's what that, the emphasis is. I want you to take notice that Miriam was leprous like snow. And Aaron turned toward Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said to Moses, Oh, buddy, oh, pal. Friend, I'm glad to know that you are my dearest friend. Don't punish us because we have done foolishly and have sinned. Let her not be as one who is dead, verse 12. Her flesh is half eaten away when he comes out of his mother's womb and Moses the first time Moses speaks says oh Lord sick them no what does Moses say Lord please heal her please but the Lord said to Moses if her father had spit in her face would she not at least be shamed for seven days let her be her, he shut outside the camp for seven days, and after that she may be brought again. So Miriam was shut outside the camp for seven days, and, and the people did not set out, uh, out on the march until Miriam was brought back in again. After that, the people set, set out from Hezeroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. You know, if God showed up and did some things like that, I wonder if we would have a different perspective on who God is. I really think that we have a very, very, very light perspective on the holiness of God. But we see the illustration of meekness in the life of Moses because he was accused and he did not defend himself. He kept silent. Here's the sublime paradox. We'll move on to number three because I'm almost out of time. Here's the paradox. Blessed are the meek, for they, what? Shall inherit the earth. I, I want to draw your attention, I can, to this passage 
in one small detail. Oftentimes in pronouns, you know, pronouns have gotten all wacky today. Have y'all noticed that? You go to the doctor anymore, what pronoun should I call you? Anyway, we'll not go there. Um, but pronouns have gotten to the place that we've sort of gotten off track, but we find the pronoun they, and so oftentimes in Scripture, it seems to be sort of a, uh, an understood, and it's inserted statement, sort of maybe not even, not even stated, but sort of, sort of implied. But here, the word they is not only implied, but it's emphasized to say this. Don't miss this. Blessed are the meek, for they and they only shall inherit the earth. In other words, if we're going to find a way to be able to connect with God on an eternal level, we're going to have to learn how to be meek. Blessed are the meek, for they and they only will inherit the earth. I thought it would be wise today, since that's being the statement, we probably would be helpful for us to, what are the steps to meekness if there are some? How can I as an individual come to the place that I can find myself as Jesus did to be defined as meek? How can I be like Moses? How can I find myself just uh, getting connected to the right way? How can I become meek? I think there's some steps here that I would like to do. And I've said this before to you, and I want to make sure that I reemphasize this on this particular week particularly. These Beatitudes are, are intimately related with each other. And we're going to see today they are actually progressional at this point. You don't start at meekness. It has to start somewhere else. But... If we're going to find a way to be eternally connected to a Savior, we're going to have to learn to become meek. And here we are. Four or no, steps to meekness, letter A in your notes. We, first of all, we've got to realize that a gentle spirit is a fruit or a byproduct of the spirit control life. I would challenge you to go back and read in your Bible, Galatians 5, starting in verse 16, all the way through the end of the chapter. Because Galatians 5 talks about the contrast between a life that's controlled by the flesh and a life that's controlled by the Spirit. Verses 16, all the way down to verse 20 or 21, is a life controlled by the flesh and the outworking is not real pretty. It's sort of the kinds of things that we see lived out in our world today. It's the things that we would understand sort of as the natural part of life. And then the transition, chapter 5, verse 22, but contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, and the list goes on and on. Gentleness is a byproduct of the Spirit-controlled life. In other words, here, here, let me just try to bring, bring it down to the, if we can, uh, to, to sort of a graspable place. When you and I accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, the Spirit of God was birthed into your life. I don't know how to say it better than it. He came to be a pres resident in your life. You got every bit of the Spirit that you'll ever get at that moment. And yet Paul says in Ephesians 5 verse 18 and following, be not drunk with wine, rather be filled with the Spirit. And the word filled is a continual process. And we almost think, well, maybe this is sort of a charismatic thing that we've got to find a way to, to be slain in the Spirit or whatever it is so that I can get more and more and more and more of the Spirit. And there's nothing further from the truth. The Scripture says clearly that you and I get every bit of the Spirit at the moment that you and I are saved. However, at the moment you and I are saved is a continual battle that will exist until you and I lay our head down on the pillow for the last time of, of coming underneath the authority of the Spirit of God in our life. You know, this is what happens in my life. Man, I can get up in the morning and I can do my devotions. I, man, I can be on cloud nine. I'm doing very well. But you let me pour out, pull out on 27 or I-4 
and the spirit-controlled life just went out the back window. It happens that way, but not just in our driving. It ha- whatever it is in our life, we, it's a continual ebb and flow in our life of, of, of surrendering to Christ's spirit and coming back taking it back ourselves, surrendering to Christ's spirit and living underneath the power of the flesh, surrendering to Christ's spirit, living underneath the authority of the flesh. And that constant battle is in our life. It should be a battle that's lessening and lessening and lessening as we grow in our relationship with Christ. But it's nevertheless a battle that we'll face the entire entirety of our life. And one of the fruits or the test or the measurements that we can actually look at our life as to whether or not our life is controlled by the spirit or not is just simply what kind of fruit is being born in our life because the fruit of the spirit you don't get to pick and choose it's not a multiplicity of fruits it's it's a fruit it's one fruit the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace gentleness goodness that's is that the thing that our life my life is being evident in right now or what's being evident in my life and if so I'm likely to be controlled by the spirit and if there's something different I'm likely to be controlled by the flesh we've got to first of all realize if we're going to understand that we've got to understand that we'll never become meek until we're willing to allow the spirit of God to be in control of our life secondly We've also got to yoke ourselves to Jesus. For it was He and He alone that becomes the incarnation of meekness. Come up, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. The, the idea was in the world of Jesus, he knew in the Greek world. They often took an an, an older ox in that day who was well-trained and yoked him with a young bull ox. You know, you you get those young bulls out here and they're they're got the chest out proud, you know, and we're, we got everything by, you know, we, we could, we could take, take the world on with, you know, just by ourselves, you know, but the reality is they take that older seasoned ox and yoke him with a young ox because if, if they do not, the young ox will never learn how to live underneath the control of the master who sits behind them. We've got to yoke ourselves with the only person in Scripture who is the incarnation of meekness. We've got to yoke ourselves with Christ so that we can learn from Him. And lastly... Here it is. I think we've got to give attention to the progression of the thought in the Beatitudes thus far. Just think about it. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are spiritually bankrupt. Blessed are those who realize that I don't bring anything to the table to help God out. Blessed are the one who found himself at the end of his or her rope, willing to simply receive what Christ has offered to them, spiritually bankrupt. And then we move to blessed are those who mourn. The person, the man or woman who's found themselves in a position that's capable of understanding the gravity of sin and the effects of sin of our life, mourning over what sin has done to us personally and over what it's doing to us as a family and what it's doing to us as a nation. Understanding the aspects and the value of grieving. And ultimately, blessed are the meek. You know, when we look at that passage... Poverty of spirit and mourning seem to be negative statements. Yet when we can understand that when true poverty of spirit and spiritual mourning are present, they make a way for the outgrowth of a positive virtue of meekness. 
in a sense, meekness is simply grown out of the first two. And the process seems so natural, and yet it is so supernatural. Meekness, hence, is self-control with, that manifests itself in a gentle spirit based on an unshakable confidence in God. Look at Scripture. The greatest men and women of the Bible were men who were meek, women who were meek. meek God, Abraham was meek. He had the courage to leave the Ur of Chaldees. Joseph was meek as he gave himself, uh, surrendered himself even to the accusations of Potiphar's wife. David was weak as he was led out into the Elah Valley. Daniel was leak as, meek as he was facing the lion's den. Mordecai was meek, realizing that the nation of Israel was, was, at, a, was at an all-time uh, difficult spot. And he, but he chose to challenge the king. And Esther was meek because she was willing to go and stand before the king, even though it might cost her her life. People who accomplished the most for God were men and women who had learned the secret of being completely yielded to God. No wonder it's said of Jesus 600 years before Jesus came to the cross. He was led like a lamb before its shearers and yet he did not speak. Potiphar tried to get him to defend himself. Are you the king or not? Jesus remained silent. And that brings us to a place of application. It's one I don't want to talk about today because it's one that I believe if we're really honest with ourselves, we all at some point in time in our journey may fail repeatedly throughout the day. But meekness is not something that you master today and fail at tomorrow. It's a progress. It's a process that you're going to continue to grow in as you learn day by day, moment by moment, to surrender yourself underneath the authority of the Spirit of God. So here's the test. Here it is. The test as to whether we're truly meek is not whether we can say that we're poor sinners. But the test has to do with what we do when someone else calls us a vile sinner. Would you stand with me please for prayer? Lord, we're humble today. Because we realize so often we find ourselves, if this were the test of meekness, we find ourselves way more often than we would like to admit failing the test. And yet, Lord, you continue to love us. You continue to invite us into a relationship with our, yourself. You continue to seek to bring us to a place even using those waters of adversity that we talked about in the beginning even as followers of Christ sometimes you bring us to the place that we're empty but you have to bring us to a place where you are able to ring the bell our bell before we'll ever listen and so God today I just pray that in the midst of all that you're seeking to do in our life as you're seeking to raise us up to become men and women of faith where our faith is not something that we talk about but something that becomes obvious and the way we respond and the way we act in this journey of life but not only obvious to ourselves but obvious to the people around us because they they see the fruit even in this passage in Matthew chapter 7 Jesus said a good tree does not bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. So in reality, God, you're seeking to raise us up to a place where that our lives exemplify the person of Jesus Christ. And yes, we Lord, we blow it. 
And I just pray and thank you, God, today for the grace of God that brought us to salvation to begin with and the grace of God that brings us to a place of forgiveness the second and third and 333rd time. But God, today, would you continue to work in our lives? We simply ask today, oh God, it may be that for some of us, You've been seeking to get our attention for quite a while and we have continued to run and run and run. But today, Father, I simply would ask on behalf of myself and on behalf of all of us as a congregation, God, that and while you don't need my permission or our permission to do this, but I would pray, oh God, that you would do to us what you must do in order that you might do through us what you desire to do. Help us, Father, to become men and women of genuine faith. Men and women who exemplify the person of Jesus Christ in every place of life. Because, Lord, our country, our state, our city is at stake. And you've called us to live as light and salt in a world who desperately needs the influence of Jesus Christ in it. And may we not seek to hide our our lights underneath a bushel, but may we radiate well the love and grace of the Lord Jesus so that many might come to faith in Jesus Christ. And maybe even some here this morning that may need to say yes to Jesus for the very first time for salvation. Would you just now draw us to yourself and do what you desire to do in our lives? Help us to understand our position and our place before you. Bring us to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.